Everybody, Nobody can hear us. Mindful of everyone's time. Let's get started, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. We'll talk. Uh, so to kick off. Uh, Approval of last meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. T's got it. All right. Thank you for that one. And then uh, next thing we have, Chief, you wanted to discuss it? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Uh, a couple of quick things from, sorry I missed the last meeting, uh, but I can, Again, continue to appreciate your work, uh, your investment in us, and um, on behalf of our community and the department, the work that we're doing together. And it is very important work, work that we, the police department, are trying to learn to do uh, and trying to learn to do with you. And so your participation uh, is very important and, uh, and we appreciate it very much. And uh, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last couple of months in terms of trying to better organize ourselves and, and have a structure in some of the, in the way that we do our work together as well. Um, and I know one of those things I'll, I'll talk about right out of the gate is we had, um, so we had committed um, in developing a structure with ADEA uh, and S3 to have a structure of when, how often, when we would present policies to you, giving you time to review and then presenting and developing a cadence of 30 days that, that that's what we would commit to do. Uh, and I know that we sent you guys three policies and less than that. Uh, and so tonight we are not going to give you that presentation. We're going to give you the 30 days and, and I want us to stick to the plan and, and stick to the structure because um, it's important that we do that and it's important that we all collab co collaboratively uh, stick to that schedule and work through it so that we can get this work done. But uh, we want to make sure that you have enough time to review the policies, review the presentations, and all of those things that go with it. So we're going to stick to that 30 days and give you, make sure that we give you time to do that. Um, so I, I know we have some other important discussions for tonight as well. Um, I want to introduce one of, the, uh, one of the new members of command staff at the police department. You might remember Captain Jeremy Grimes. Um, he was head of the support services division, which involved our communication center, our record section, um, our, our technology uh, section as well. And we have, we have taken that position uh, and civilianized it uh, and made it a, a professional staff member. Uh, and so a, the newest member in that role, the Support Services Division Administrator, is Tamaya Smith. Tamaya? <laughs> so, Tamaya has been with the police department uh, 27, 28 years. Uh, she has previously been long-term uh, the operations manager in our communication center, in the 911 center. And so she will be transitioning now to the administrator position and will be a member of, of the PD's command staff uh, officially. So we welcome her uh, and look forward to, to working with her in that capacity. But uh, this has not really been made public yet, but I wanted to share with you uh, that news and, and her work as the newest member of command staff. So. Um, and, and you'll be hearing from her and meeting her along the way uh, in our work as well. So um, that's the news that I have. Uh, and again, look forward to, uh, to working with you uh, the rest of the way here. Well, next on our agenda, we um, put the working group has been working and meeting um, weekly on Tuesdays at 5.30. They um, wanted to have some additional discussion in regards to use of policies uh, pertaining to proportionality and levels of force. So, um, I don't know which member of the working group would like to kick off that discussion. Yes, the entire use of force team here. See if Stephanie is there's Stephanie. Oh, she just came out. Yeah, I was just going to text her. I was hemming and hawing. <laughs> we were waiting to see if maybe Stephanie would show up. And she did. <laughs> uh, we're 
so efficient tonight. We're on time. <laughs> so we've been working as for everybody that isn't on those uh, working group meetings. We've been meeting pretty regularly and making some progress through the, the policy, but it's slower going than I think we had originally anticipated. Um, and what we're finding is some of these things uh, we can come to uh, sort of a consensus as we go, uh, but other things we're finding that we're kind of bouncing around because we're not sure if others are gonna share the same uh, view or if there's more robust conversation to be had. Um, obviously, everybody's able to uh, submit their own recommendations on the policy, but if we're trying to work through it in some sort of cohesive manner in these groups, um, there's been a few things that crop up where um, we wanted to open up for broader discussion here in the general meeting. There's one specifically that comes to mind for me, but I know Stephanie had more, uh, Kathleen had more, I think, that wanted to address. So if you're situated, I, maybe you take it from here about what are those things specifically, because you had the list somewhere. Yes. Yeah, and for the other people who are there, yeah, feel free to share. <laughs> It just happened last week. There were just the three of us there. So, um, so I think, did we want to start with proportionality? Yeah. Sure. Is that the one that you wanted to address? No. The one that uh, is high on my list is the uh, deadly force definition. Oh, we can start with that, that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> as we're going through, um, currently we're at the different uh, levels of force that are defined and then... Uh, there's policies controlling uh, what level of force um, should be met with the level of force from the officer um, and under what conditions. Um, we've gone around before on the issue of deadly force and uh, that the definition is not exactly what you would think of just with the term deadly force. Uh, under the penal code, deadly force is not just that level of force which causes the death of a person, but it's any level of force that uh, has a substantial likelihood of causing the death or serious bodily injury to a person. Um, and that's more than just pain or discomfort, uh, more than cuts and bruises and scratches. Uh, but it's some level of force that would, or some level of injury that would be considered basically great bodily injury or serious bodily injury. Things like concussion, broken bones, um, extensive suturing, that kind of thing. And so we talked about the canine policy originally and how the um, injuries sustained from the canine may actually fit into that category. Um, and so as we're going through these levels of force, we're kind of tap dancing around whether we want to acknowledge that uh, deadly force is that broader definition, that it's uh, force that's likely to cause death or serious bodily injury, or if, on the other hand, as a group, we think that deadly force is limited not by the definition in the penal code, but just by the terms themselves, where somebody is likely to get killed by it. Um, so I think, at least for my own part, I wanted to have the input of other CAP members, um, whether they think we should give it that broader penal code definition or the more narrow definition as we're going through this. Any thoughts? Personally, I prefer the narrow definition as opposed to the broader definitions. So having worked not at all with the law specifically, but uh, school side different things, it seems like the broader we made our definitions, the harder it was to uh, for teachers and people who needed to work within those structures to understand and define what we were trying to do. So sometimes. Broader is not better, sometimes narrow is 
better and easier to understand. I, I concur with, with Robert on a, a little more narrow, um, just because in, as it applies to the policy and how we're looking at it, I mean, the, the, the more broad we make it, it's going to, I think it's going to lead us into the weeds a little bit. Go ahead. That's uh, just my opinion. I mean, I think that here, um, you know, the, the way that the statute defines it includes this aspect of serious bodily injury. So it's something that's already in the law. So it wouldn't be something that we're necessarily sort of straying too far afield from. And it's something that's already in law and, and officers should be trained on this anyway. <coughs> um, it's just sort of really um, clarifying that in the law. I mean, I'm sorry, clarifying that in the policy that when we're talking about deadly force, you know, really reminding officers that it also includes this other aspect of serious bodily injury, right? Because otherwise you, I mean, that's still the law and um, leaving that sort of gap in the policy could potentially expose CPD <coughs> to liability if someone were to be, um, you know, if, if some sort of excessive use of force incident were to occur and the person were to sustain um, some sort of serious bodily injury, they could file a lawsuit against BPD um, and say that, you know, the force that they used um, is, is uh, the type that could lead to deadly force, right? It, it, it resulted in this serious bodily injury. Um, and so, you know, it could, it could potentially expose um, BPD to liability. And I think it just really sort, sort of like clarifies if we were to, inca you know, make sure that the, the definition of, of deadly force um, includes this serious bodily injury. It's what the law requires. So it's not something that is that we're creating to, to make it more broad. It's it's what the law already requires, and it's um, illustrating to to BPD and to the officers the types of force mechanisms that are used utilized that can result in those types of um, like and and results right the serious right. bodily injury or death right. So like in the statute it says. For example, uh, including but not limited to firearms, right? So that's like the one example it gives in in this in the statute. But like, if you look at the use of canines, for example, the use of canines often result in in life altering and life threatening um, injuries. Um, oftentimes, uh, they are very serious um, injuries that that are sustained. Um, you know the the. I mean, we kind of already talked about this when we reviewed the canine policy, but canines are trained um, with sort of like pain compliance and um, the way that canines engage uh, into a person's skin. Right? They're like deep punctures that even when um, they release their jaw um, or, or are forced to release their jaw with outing tools that like these metal bars that are stuck down their throats to create a gag reflex, um, you know, by pulling them off, like you, you, you create just additional injuries. It can um, sever in nerves and create like loss of limbs. Um, so, so my main concern about this is the whole great bodily injury is, and this is from my framework is it's applied to people. Great bodily injury is applied in criminal behavior where somebody is breaking the law and a private citizen is injuring another human being, causing great bodily injury, right? And that that's what I'm, what I'm concerned about, is applying a criminal <coughs> application to something that officers are doing in the line of work in order to care, carry out public safety. And so, so the intent, the- That might be my fault in phrasing the question. The, my, but what I'm just saying is, is, is if we, apply that, are we not applying the same parameters to officers who are, are, are performing a service to the community that we would apply to somebody who is harming the community? In my, in my perspective, by doing that, um, we're, I think the officers are already aware of the capacity 
of great bodily injury. So again, I just think that if it's overly broad, we're creating a situation for officers that I, I just think is a slightly bit unfair because they are trying to do their job. And depending on, I, I'm, that's just my perspective. Sorry, just to clarify. Yeah. Um, it's, so it wouldn't be applying like a different standard necessarily. The law already yeah, so contemplates serious police. bodily injury when you're talking about like use of force. So like yeah. in the in the statute that talks about like use of force and deadly use of force, it already talks about serious bodily injury. And that's something that officers already um, account for. I don't know, Jacob, if you want to expand on that or more because I think you were trying to chime in. But um, so it wouldn't be that we would be applying this like criminal aspect to it or, or this individual, like this separate body of law. It's, it's already what officers are, the, the parameters that officers are already working under, I guess, if that helps clarify. Yeah, but. yeah so I should clarify the question a little bit, and then I actually have a follow-up for Lover. Um, when we've been going through this, there's uh, the question of what level of force is being used by the officer in a given set of circumstances. Okay. There's also a separate, separate question of how you might describe the conduct of the person that the officer is trying to subdue or control or arrest or whatever the task at hand might be, right? So the question of, just for the sake of this conversation, let's call them the suspect. The question of the level of force being used by the suspect is a separate question than uh, what level of force is appropriate for the officer. And that's not to say they're totally out of alignment with one another, but they are dead, separate issues. Um, in defining the term deadly force under the penal code, it's talking about uh, the, that level of force by the officer, uh, which is likely to, or has a substantial likelihood of causing death or serious bodily injury. That's a different analysis than is the person, is the suspect themselves engaged in criminal conduct, which is uh, an assault. Likely result 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 result. great bodily injury. Right. So th that's, just, they're very similar language, but they're different analyses. And so if we have the penal code definition as sort of, a, at a minimum, a baseline, we're finding it somewhat difficult to refer to deadly force, even in those circumstances where death is not necessarily likely to result, but serious bodily injury is quite likely to result. And that would still be under the umbrella of deadly force. So now by way of follow-up, Robert, you were talking about um, having simplicity of terms, especially from a teaching perspective. Are you thinking, in terms of teaching officers, or in a separate context of well, from my experience, okay, on a school site for, for 30 years, we went through a process where we tried to expand and define our discipline code. There seemed to be <laughs> some areas that needed uh, some attention. And and it seemed like the more we followed it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. The harder it was for people to understand it and manage it, and then even enforce it, because there was, there was too much, and it became very unwieldy. And we had to simplify it back then just to make it a little more uh, manageable for parents and for teachers and for administrators and for the kids. I can say, but maybe if we change the word deadly to extreme force, you would see it would be seen differently. I don't think we're trying to make it be like extremely, extremely broad, but 
I think most people, I mean, maybe canines is controversial, right? But most people, most, even most officers would know the difference between something that would cause bodily injury and something that is, is minor. But I think it's more serious than a school. I mean, I worked at a school too, and I would say sometimes it was better to have broad, and sometimes it was better to have narrow, but let's say you're trying to decide whether students have, had international students, and they were gonna get, they might have to be deported if, because uh, if they missed one more day for being sick, so should I, can I make it a broad thing that if they're certain, rather than we have, you can only have exactly this many hours of absence, so it just depends. So I don't think it's that simple, but I don't really think, we're arguing what the law already says, and it just maybe it should be clarified so that it's very clear that this should be really taken seriously, that this could cause bodily injury, rather than, well, it's not deadly. So my question is that, so we're trying to narrow, uh, narrow the definition of what the penal code is already saying. Is that what I'm, I'm hearing? Because I, I don't think that we can do that. That's, I mean, that was my that was my point when we're looking at these when we're uh, we can't really start to change and narrow down these penal codes too much because now you're looking at law versus administrative uh, stuff. So if somebody broke an administrative like violated the policy, that's different than violating a penal code because the penal code is a legal standing. So I'm just trying to figure out what we're we were having a hard time finding the, the right words, yeah. maybe, as we were going through this. Um, and so actually, I'm taking something from Robert's comment that maybe what would be useful in our working group is to sort of coin a new term where um, maybe we distinguish between fatal force, right, like that, that use of force that actually resulted in a person's death and the term that the penal code has given us of deadly force, maybe that would help us to distinguish um, when we're actually talking about somebody's death and then the more broad term under the penal code of the, the force that's likely to result in death or... Because the penal code is already broad, you're saying. Right. Yeah. So when we talk about deadly force and canines and these other types of force options, there's a lot of force options out there that have a likelihood to cause serious bodily injury. Even a takedown in the right circumstances could cause serious bodily injury. And that, by definition, may fall under the same definition that we are reading in uh, 835 of the Penal Code or talking about in our deadly force policy. So if you look at it too specifically to, uh, I mean, you could apply it to a whole slew of different circumstances. If I went out and I had to take uh, you know, an 80-year-old woman to jail and she's refusing to go to jail and she's, she's resisting arrest and I have to take her down onto the concrete, she very well may get serious bodily injury. That doesn't make that necessarily a deadly force uh, qualifying event. Now, anything that leads to the death of the civilian is gonna be considered deadly force or it's gonna be investigated the same way as a deadly force incident may be, like uh, through the critical incident review process. So, I mean, I don't, I understand where, where some of you guys are, are, are reading those definitions that, you know, serious bodily injury. Yes, yes, canines can cause serious bodily injury. A baton strike can cause serious bodily injury. A lot of things can. But the specifics of the penal code as it relates to deadly force is, is more so, obviously, for firearms. I mean, there's, there's times when officers use their firearms and then they don't hit anyone. And it's still investigated as a deadly force incident. Because it's not the outcome that's decided, it's the intention of the act that the officer does that determines what type of force. Does that provide any clarification, hopefully? Yes, sir. Um, so for the penal code, it says any use of force that creates a substantial risk of causing death or serious bodily injury. And I guess the difference between like a takedown where certainly in certain, in certain circumstances, 
it could lead to deadly force, right? If the person is um, taken down in a certain way or restrained in a certain way or like knees or in certain ways it can create like a risk of positional asphyxia and, and that would be like deadly force. But, um, you know, like canines, for example, the release of a canine or sometimes the unintended or accidental release of a canine, which has occurred um, and, and it has occurred by, by BPD, um, poses a, a, a more sort of substantial risk. It, it's a, a more known and substantial risk um, than perhaps some of the other force tools. And I think it's just providing guidance to officers of what, what sort of um, things that are used um, you know, like, I hate to use the word tools, but like tools that are, you know, quote unquote, used um, to, to use force or to, to assist officers in, um, in, in carrying out their duties, which ones of those carry this, you know, substantial risk of causing death or serious bodily injury. And I think that, um, you know, there's a balance that can be stricken where, where it provides more clarity, is more aligned with the, with the penal code, um, but provides a little bit more clarity to officers as to what unquote, tools fall under that. Um, and, and, um, and, and, you know, like, because it, yes, there, you know, there are these other um, things that could, but perhaps they are more likely to fall under a different level of, of force. Um, I think maybe the operative words here would be substantial risk, right? Because yeah. just because something is foreseeable or that it could result in anybody in the takedown might wind up with a broken arm, right? Um, there's going to be a difference in the degree of risk as you tweak the knobs of any given hypothetical. Um, and so maybe it's more useful for us to to focus on the likelihood and the degree of injury that's going to result, uh, which are by, well, they're deliberately vague, right? They're deliberately, there's a lot of gray area. Um, and so the, certainly we would never expect any officer to be intentionally engaging in force that's going to, you know, injure a person where that is their aim, right? The officer's aim is going to be to effectuate the arrest or stop an attacker, et cetera. Um, but if the focus is on what's the likelihood of harm, maybe that's where we need to refocus our efforts in the, um, in the working group. Isn't that, isn't that almost, I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, all of the tools in a police arsenal have the a baton, a canine, a taser, all of those things have the capacity to significantly injure. Yeah, Even, that's my point. So, I mean, how, I mean... So the mere so, possibility is enough. It's got to be, under certain sense, what's the likely substantial risk mm -hmm. under the definition of the code. I have a question. Sorry. 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 Uh, from Before you get, can I just respond real quick? Sure. So, like, um, and that's why... Um, the additional policies, like we've, we've clarified, it, it narrows down a little bit more the different force types and like what areas they fall into. And there's caveats in every single part. Um, and as you guys go through these next policies on control devices and conducted energy weapons, you'll see that there's there's caveats in each one that if death were to result or if that seriously body injury were to result, it gets treated as a deadly force uh, incident. And it has to be justified through the same means as using a firearm. So maybe that's the crux of the question is, do we want to treat only those situations that do result in death as deadly force? Or do we want to make sure that we're including those circumstances where death doesn't result, but it may have still been the likely result given the, the conduct that was at issue? Right? And, I, and, I, and I understand the, where you're coming from with those things. The problem that I, that I see with it is if we take the language of sustain, uh, uh, of serious bodily injury or the, the, the increased risk or the likelihood of serious bodily injury to occur, then we're taking a whole bunch of options and a whole bunch of tools that are available to an officer that are, by definition, less lethal, and we're categorizing them as deadly force. And if, if we're taking that 
all those, those tools more or less. We're taking canines and batons and uh, tasers and all these things that have the likelihood that they may cause serious bodily injury and we're classifying all of them as serious bodily injury type weapons, then there'd be no legal definition or no uh, policy definition in the difference of an officer using a firearm or a baton or a canine because if we're looking at it from that scope, then anything could be justified the same as a firearm. I don't think, uh, sorry, I don't think that's, this is, oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, yeah. Just, in, in practical experience, how many canine incidents where the canine is released to bite the suspect, how many of those incidents actually result in serious bodily injury? Um, well, I mean, I was never a canine handler, so I don't know if there's any canine handlers in the room that have a better perspective I mean, on that. But. I expect you all have statistics, right? You keep track of, of those incidents because they require special investigation. So, uh, generally. Well, a canine deployment de that requires uh, an investigation just like any use of force. Does. A sergeant has to respond to well, the same. What are the statistics? Are we talking 50%? 90%? Those are statistics we can get to. I don't have those statistics off the top of my head of whether they resulted in serious bodily injury. And again, it comes back to the, folks, no? again, it comes back to the, the definition of how we're defining serious bodily injury. Because by the penal code definition, it's defined as uh, uh, broken bones, severe suturing, uh, disfigurement, things of that sort. So there, there is a high number of incidents where canines are used and, and there's little to no injury. Uh, I mean, and this, this is just my own personal experience of canine engagements that I've been a witness to or been a part of during arrest and, and whatnot. Um, so I don't have the statistics with me, obviously. I, we, can, we can work on getting those to you guys That'd in the next week. Sure, I, I was a, a canine handler way back in the day, you know, uh, back then. So I, I, I can't speak specifically to the incidents that resulted in serious bodily injury. I can't speak to the incidents that resulted in serious bodily injury. I can't speak to the incidents that resulted in serious bodily injury. I can't speak to the incidents that resulted in serious bodily injury. I can't speak to the incidents that resulted in serious bodily injury. I can't speak to the incidents that resulted in serious bodily injury. I can't speak to the incidents that resulted in serious bodily injury. I can't speak to the incidents that definitely classified or would be meet the definition of serious bodily injury. They were um, the exception to the rule. The, the majority of uh, engagements that I had, and it, it was over my career, it was somewhere in the ballpark of 40. Um, very few, that, yeah, very few resulted in what, yes, very, well, there was way more than 40 uh, where I actually released my dog for a search and stuff, but 40 actual engagements where the dog would get assessed. Okay. Um, the vast majority of those engagements resulted in very minor injuries. Uh, would be uh, punctures that did not uh, require suturing, um, or uh, scratches, or, or you know, kind of bruising. That was is by far the the most typical result of um, what my experience was. That's now, I can't say that that's true for every game I handle throughout the state of California. I, I, I don't know what those are. Um, but I think that is to uh, Jacob's point about what is um, likely to result in, or has a significant risk of resulting in serious bodily injury. Now, I think, like the Sergeant Bishop was talking about, with any uh, force option, there is a possibility. I don't know that there's a probability. I, I know that Jacob's argument that he believes that canines do result in a probability of that. I, I don't know that I agree that can't qualify under that same aspect. I understand the argument that it is making, and I, I think it's um, well founded in, in the rationale he has. I just don't personally think that I share his opinion on that, that it qualifies the same way. So, so, so Captain, what you said, Sergeant, and I think uh, uh, I'll send it back, back here, says the same thing. So, so any use of force has the possibility, not necessarily the probability, of getting a great bodily injury. Is that correct? Well, I mean, it really depends on circumstances that go into it. I mean, there may be a, a whole slew of things that can happen where uh, a, a, a death results in part from an officer using force, even lower levels of force. I mean, we can look at you know, incidents all across the country where an in-custody death has resulted as officers were using force. And there may be contributing factors from the officers using force. There may be you know, narcotic factors, the person's individual health factors, a whole sort of slew of things that could go into it. But there's also countless homicides that happen throughout the country every year where people are killed with another person's bare hands or with a stick or with a rock or with another object that might be similarly classified to what an officer is using as uh, an intermediate force option. And the difference is that officers are trained to recognize these, uh, these tools as those intermediate, like higher level force options, but not to the level of deadly force. 
in those situations where we're trying to not use our firearms. We're trying to use these as lower levels of force to overcome resistance, affect an arrest, prevent escape, defend ourselves or themselves, officers, from these threats out there, from weapons and things like that, but not quite rising to the level of needing to use a firearm. And the, the caution that I, uh, that I recommend or, or that I've kind of seen and reading is, is if we are too overly broad in categorizing everything as serious bodily injury or death, so everything with serious bodily injury or death is deadly force, then there's no difference from officers using a baton that could cause serious bodily injury or a firearm that could cause serious bodily injury. And that's just the, the, the problem I foresee with the, the back and forth with that, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know if, if confining is the right term, but it would definitely be problematic. Um, we train officers, and uh, the vast majority of our training that we do is, is uh, reality-based training. You know, we try as much as we can to put officers into uh, scenarios where they're making decisions with real actors that are our instructors that we've trained, with uh, simulators that have real people that they're interacting with on a screen, and they have a whole series of force options that they use. And those force options may change throughout an incident. You know, an officer may be met with a deadly threat as soon as they arrive on a call where the person is armed with a gun in their hand. And then that, that scenario may change where the, the person discards the gun, but now they're putting their fists up and they're ready to fight. The force options available to an officer are going to change throughout an incident based on the suspect's behavior. Because the way that we train is for them to have a, um, not so much the suspect's level of force, but the suspect's level of resistance. What we do with the force that we apply to a person is always going to be in response to their resistance. I don't think the recommendation is to capture, to, to say all of them. I think it's, it's going back to what Jacob was saying, the operative terms which are, you know, creates a substantial risk. I mean, it, it is what it is in the, in the penal code. Um, you know, I think statistics were more information about the, the use of canines. It's something that folks had asked about when we were doing the canine policy revision, and um, that data was not provided to us. But, you know, any sort of information that you all can share with us on not just canines, but other, other tools of use of force or other information on use of force, I think would be illuminating to this group and would be really helpful because... Um, you know, uh, sometimes we come into this space and we just share a anecdotal stories, which are not not to minimize them. They're they're very important and they're really they're they're very real and they are things that have happened to the community. Um, uh, you know, but sometimes um, for some folks, what what really um, helps some folks is, is seeing the data. Some people are more like numbers people, right? Um, um, and so I think having access to that sort of information would be really helpful um, to this group as we consider, you know, the different levels of force, as we consider these other policies that you all are to introduce. I mean, on the on the canine um, serious bodily injury, you know, I, I it's. Um, you know, you, you noted that it, it depends on how you define serious bodily injury, um, which is true, and I think that sort of varies um, for every sort of police department. They all have sort of their own interpretation of serious bodily injury under um, what the statute says. But there are incidents that, um, you know, need to be reported um, to the California Department of Justice every year that result in serious bodily injury um, or death. And for example, like in 2020, I believe BPD reported um, like nine of the, you know, whatever many um, incidents that, that BPD reported to Cal DOJ, like none, nine of those were involving canines that resulted in a serious bodily injury. And that's going to fluctuate year to year. And, you know, not everything that is not just just because it was not reported to the, the to the DOJ does not mean that it did not result in serious bodily injury, um, right? There, there, it, it could just not have fallen within BPD's interpretation of serious bodily injury. Um, but, but I guess what I'm saying is, um, I guess to to your point, is not that we would capture every instance or every tool that could potentially, um, or you know that that. Every tool, it, it's just those that would fall within this um, substantial risk. And I think that, you know, that's part of this conversation that we wanted to have was, you know, as a collective, talk about, like, these different tools, um, you know, talk to you all about how, um, you know, like, how they're being used, how, you know, like, sort of getting more information on data, um, because I think that will help 
um, help inform, you know, creating some sort of like um, continuum of force or some sort of like, you know, matrix or some sort of understanding of like these should fall here and these should fall here. Um, you know, just because it's been done a particular way doesn't mean that it always has to be done that way. I mean, part of the reason why we're here is, you know, because there were, you know, there was a multi-year investigation into into BPD for um, certain patterns and practices. And, um, you know, I think it's important to, to recognize the reason why we're here and the, you know, like we recognize the, the, the job that you all have at hand at, at protecting the community um, and, and we, we respect that. And so how do, we, how do we come together as a whole and work as a whole alongside you all to ensure that, you know, we, we like really safeguard the, the rights of our community um, uh, in a way that is uh, it's true to the spirit of the stipulated judgment um, and yeah, I mean. One of the things I'd like to do when we're working on our election is to think that there is, there is data available on our dashboard, on the home, on the website, and the transparency, because if we're working to support the dashboard, we were able to buy here, which goes back to, right from wrong, what year is it? I think it's five years. Uh -huh. I think it goes back five years. It goes back five years. There's a new source data on our website that you can, if you see the real time, it's updated every quarter. So for the last five years, all the use of source data is just on the dashboard and available for the public future. Do you have a question, Eugene? Yeah, I have a question. I'm still, I'm still trying to get some clarity and some understanding. I know when this panel came up, it was about looking at the policy. focuses of the CAP panel is to make sure that the policies that we've developed are in compliance with the stipulated judgment. But another very important part of the CAP panel is we want to make sure that all of these aspects of the community are heard. Yes. If there's things specific to a policy that Bakersfield police officers are going to operate under, we want to make sure that the community does have some input on that. And I understand that it does complicate things because it kind of drags stuff out. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to hear and, and gain a consensus from a whole room of 18 uh, people from all different parts of the community. But I think that's one of the beautiful things about this, too, is it brings all these different corners of the community together to hear these voices and talk about these different things so that we can come up with a collective decision on positive changes that we can add to or remove from our policy. Um, so I 100% understand and I hear what, what your, your concern is, that things kind of get log jammed. And we're concerned with it, too. I think that you know some of these policies we should have had presented and updated and done and, and, and been out there practicing. But, we're exactly asking why, how is the policy meeting the penal code? That's what we're talking about. We're not changing the penal code. It's not, it's not about the policy meeting the penal code. That's what we're talking about. Because the whole thing is the stipulated judgment. It's not about the policy meeting the penal code. The penal code, as they said, is too broad. It's too broad. So, so you so to try to compare the stipulated judgment and the policy to a penal code, you're not going you're, you're to be able to change that. Because now you're trying to recreate too much. The only thing we need to do is see was the was the, the new policy that we need to try and get, did it meet the stipulated judgment? And if it didn't, what areas did it not meet? 
So we can just address those areas. Yeah. I, I would just, add one just thing. Just I would add a couple things on that. That and like Sergeant Bishop said, we are, we are here because and you are here working, working with, with us. Uh, and I, again, grateful, grateful that you are, but it is to represent our community that does our use of force policy, our proposal policy, certainly is, is it consistent with the stipulated judgment? And that, that, that is a question that's relevant to you. But, but also is, does it meet our community's expectations in our use of force policy? That's another question. And you're here to weigh in on that and give us a use of policy, make recommendations and as a community member that we think that this. This, this meets, meets our needs and expectations as a community. That is what, what your role is. So it's not simply to weigh in and then make a judgment if it meets the stipulated judgment. It gives us also to represent our community's concerns and our community's and that's our policy. The way we are going to police that we're proposing to be governed by this kind of policy parameters doesn't meet our community's expectations. That's what we're here to do the voice of our community to give us recommendations that we believe our community would want this. And we believe the policy can be improved by this. And those are the kinds of recommendations also that we're seeking from you as well. And again, somebody already said it. You can still have unity in this process without complete agreement on every single item. And that's not going to be achieved. It's not possible really anywhere. Uh, but it's, it is important work. It is important work that we want to work with you and engage with you on. Certainly, from my perspective, it's important that we move this along because we want to get these implemented. We want to be in a lot of ways because the things that are right and that we need to change, we're going to do that. So, so but the policy, to get it in place, to get it finalized and implemented, and begin training everybody and holding everybody to this higher standard, this improved standard, is very, very important to us. We want to get, we want to, get to that work as soon as we can. But, but also a little respect, you do respect the work that you're doing here, a lot of work at that, and in revealing these things as well. So, so I want to be too simplistic about it. That's not just checking the box of things. That's not what it is. It is a stipulated judgment compliance, but it allows also, as community representatives, does this proposed policy meet the needs and expectations of the community? That's where your voice is to be exercised here and to give us those recommendations so that we you make these decisions and move on. Just reading from the stipulated judgment, Eugene, uh, it says that that we will meet at least bi-monthly uh, to provide input into policy and procedure, to provide insight into the community's concerns, and educate the community. So, so that, that, I think that it was just to sign off on the how, how the change policy meets the, the, the DOJ's requirements, the DOJ would be much better, more qualified to do that. But, but our, our role is, goes beyond that. that. That's included, but it does go beyond that, I think. And then I ask you a question, because that, yes, it's not saying just to sign off, it's just saying that we supposed to be reviewing what the policy and the two are so we can come to a decision. But it seems like some of the some of the going way deeper where we are spending more time in investigating and coming up with the actual solution. So I, think, I think part of it is we're we're, we're, we're really, really just beginning to to, to, to have dialogue. Yes, we spent a, a year kind of, of wandering in, in the wilderness, yes. I would say. So, so I think we're. Trying to figure out how to really make some progress. I think also we need to remember that this this meeting is a great opportunity to discuss and want to engage with the people. Right, as you guys are doing your individual um, work in reviewing these policies and making recommendations, this time should be used to collaborate with the people, ask the questions that you're asking, get the feedback. But ultimately, again, the consensus. I don't think that necessarily gives BPD the recommendations that are necessary in order to affect change, or, or at least be able to see and then respond to what the community is asking. So at the end of the day, as we're having these discussions, we want to each of you to distill that down to a recommendation that BPD has to look at, analyze, and respond to. That's the activity that we're really trying to get to, and having open discussion helps us get there. But again, it's not about consensus. Everybody has a different perspective.
aspect of that problem of this community. So something that that might be some of the frustration being felt is everyone kind of has a different perspective. But everyone doesn't have to have consensus. I think once we take consensus off the table, this discussion opens up a little bit and perspectives open up a little bit. And again, your recommendations are your recommendations representing your community. And each of those communities deserve to have those recommendations told and responded to by the community. Yeah, I'm just um, I'll be from my age, and I think that we're working on the youth sports policy, but that's here or there. I'm just trying to figure out the level of force definition of application and how to categorize what was the work we're really looking at in like when I looked at the whole use of the workforce policy compared to the one that was written, the old one didn't have definitions. It didn't have the level of detail that this one does. So I'm just trying to figure out how deep are we trying to go with all of this stuff so we can move forward and get to the other policies that we need to get to to review. So I'm not. I'm not getting this discussion. discussion or trying to get an understanding and a perspective from the BPD to dive into what we're looking for. So, so what, what is serious part of the We need to discuss that over and over. So I wanted to hear how BPD defines the serious part of the And I'm thinking to a degree when we first introduced this, those definitions were given to us back then. And, and that's, this, this is what, what I'm, I'm trying to say. It was like, no, I remember us going over that, splitting into groups in, in this room, room taking different sections, sections and BPD explained to us each of the sections of what the use of workforce was. was from yeah. daily workforce, they did, did a whole presentation on it. That's, that's why like now I'm trying to figure out, out what, what are we trying, trying to get out of further from them when, when I, I know for sure, sure we've, we've been, been over, over this already. already. It was a very, very oh, summary definition. It was not a discussion like this where we could ask questions. It was just, I mean, I'm a teacher. I know what definitions are. And you, a definition needs to be expanded to ask, well, what, how would you do that? And that's what we're trying to do. I think part of our frustration is some people are, this, we, this is why we part of the reason I've gotten anywhere, is because some people can't bear it when we want to go deep. And you can't, if, if we can't go deep, our voice isn't heard. But for you, it's frustrating. because. No, but that's what it feels like. And no, it's felt no, like that since the beginning. Well, you can yeah, tell that me that you don't mean that. But that, that, that's fine. You, you have, have policies, policies education, education, definitions, and law enforcement policy definitions are different. different. You, you can, can be an educator and get definitions on you. I work in education right now, too. too. I've, I've also, also worked in law enforcement and have great policies. I know for a fact they're different. So, so we're comparing apples and oranges. I'm, I'm just trying to find out from the group what, what was the purpose? purpose? Or what, or what are, are you trying to get out of A for A? a? What, what are, are you trying, trying to get from, from BPD that we didn't get back, back in November <coughs> or whenever we first introduced this? Because I know these definitions were given to us. And it, it wasn't was general. general. It, it was in detail. detail. We asked them questions. We split up, up in groups. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure <laughs> out why okay, are we still going, going over the same thing six months later. I'll, I went, yeah, go ahead first. Um, so I'll try to respond, and other people should feel free to chime in. Um, I think part, so at that meeting where BPD presented on the use of force policy, they gave sort of a, a general overview of the things that, at least how I remember it, a general overview of the things that in this new policy or this proposed policy, things that they changed, um, changes that they made um, from their old policy to this like proposed policy. And part of that did include some definitions, as, as you're saying. When we broke up into the groups, I think the conversations that each group had 
looked very different depending on the dynamic of that group and what that group wanted to focus in on. So um, maybe like my group didn't go into as much depth as, as your group. And so, you know, there, but as, as a whole, as a cap as a whole, there weren't these sorts of conversations. Since then, we've been meeting in a working group to sort of dive in further and compare this policy not just to the previous policy and say like, okay, cool, these are like track changes and like what BPD made, but like to compare it also to the terms of the stipulated judgment to make sure that like those terms are um, incorporated here and some of those terms are not incorporated here and some of those terms could be uh, clarified better to provide clarity not just to BPD officers but also to the community which is something that I, I think folks have raised in this space before about how uh, the the you know the, 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 the wording or the definitions or the phrases used is too legal easy sometimes and, and how do we distill that down in a way that if a community member were to read this they could get or grasp like the general sort of concepts. And so anyways, to your to your like question I think that you were asking about like how deep do we are we diving in, it's not just looking at the stipulated judgment, like the, the, the explicit terms, but the stipulated judgment also says that these policies have to comply with state and federal laws. And so when we're talking about state laws, these these are the, the like the penal codes that we're talking about today, right? Because it's it there's no point in having um, a policy that doesn't comply with state law because then that just exposes BPD to liabilities of being sued for not being compliant with state or federal laws. Um, so I guess what we're, we're taking sort of like a holistic approach which is called for in the terms of the stipulated judgment itself where it says, like it's, sorry to repeat myself, where it says to also look at the state um, state laws and, and federal laws or whatever, but that that's, I guess that's the, the, the dive that we're trying to do is, is just at least ensuring that, um, you know, with, with at least these critical state laws, maybe maybe we won't address all of the state laws, right, because it's, it's just too many and there's too much, um, but like at least with these critical ones, like, like use of force where it's clearly defined in, in state law, um, and just really making sure that it, it complies with that as well. Does that help answer, or I don't know? One of the things that I think is that I wrote away from that level of confusion process, once the policy leads to that, this is just for everybody's information, once the policy is, we need to see what recommendations we make, adjustments, whatever that may be, it still has to go to the Department of Justice for the review. The Department of Justice will review it to determine is it in compliance with the state trade rate? Is it in compliance with the law? They, they won't make those, those kinds of judgments. They, they can't make the judgment that, it's, that it meets the needs of your certain level community. community. That's, that's why you're here. here. And that, and that can be further restricted to some potential for your recommendation for us. That's really what, what, from my perspective, I see the work working for you. The people's judgment of that is going to be made by, by the Department of Justice when they prove that this policy is in compliance with the state of their judgments. It certainly will have to be consistent with the policy. I just want to bring up another passage. Just go there. Okay. Part of the thing is, I get what you guys are saying, but one of the things is, I hear a lot of discussion, and we have a lot to talk. But until something was said a little while ago, when they said you have officers here to ask the question, a lot of the meetings you're not asking officers the question. So that's why we keep coming back to the same point. If, if, if you guys have a meeting, there should be a list of questions. So as soon as we come in, we, we should be asking targeting them to get all the answers. So that way, you can get some, some of your questions answered and you can move forward. But if we're not asking them no questions, then they're just here for a meeting. Well, that's what I'm saying. 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 Well, well, part of it, that's why the agenda items are here, the, the specific uh, policies and things they wanted to be focused on by, from the study group. They, 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 they pull those out and put them on the agenda so that they can be addressed here and have a open up a dialogue between, uh, uh, well, well, almost everyone here. So that, that was a targeted thing to put them on the uh, agenda so that we can get you. It's not a private meeting. It's a group meeting. Well, it's still, you didn't question the officers in any way back to the meeting where you discuss the things where 
expert, and now you don't have none of their answers. So how do you go and discuss something where you don't, unless one of these people is actually standing in your group to ask a question for you, and then you still wait until the very day later to get those answers. So that, that's what I was going to have asked a couple of questions today that we to, directly to the BPD we haven't gotten a, a, a reply to. We, we still need statistics. Um, I would like to, um, I know you can't read our thoughts and what statistics we want, but it came up during the canine policy and it's coming up again here. We would like some data and we would like some data. That's what you're referring to, the actual is all there. Okay, so I, I did try to go there and, and I wasn't able to, to look it up, so. Um, but if, if it is available in the dashboard and if somebody has from BPD is maybe a little more savvy on how to navigate the data, um, that would be amazing. That would be amazing to help us. I think proceed with some of this information. Just again, so that we have. Okay. Are there any specific questions that we have? I heard that there's a need for some of the statistics on the data and whatnot to cheaper address out. How that can be accessible. Are there any specific questions as it relates to some of the agenda items? Yeah. I think if we can switch back to, to proportionality, I have a question on that. And I want to say, too, we're very happy we have some, some people leading the meeting now, so it's much easier to have dialogue. We, we didn't have that opportunity all the time in the same way, because often other CAP members would shut it down. So that would, it's like, don't ask them to, anyway. So I'm happy that we have, we're, I feel like we've made a lot of progress. So I would, okay, maybe we can't do both at the same time. Um, well, I, would, I was working on 300.4, you know, reading the proportionality, and I liked a lot of what I read, but there's one sentence I'd like to read and, and get either CAP members' perspective to see if they hear it the same way I do, and then BPD's perspective. Uh, it's the part that said the proportionality principle demands that law enforcement interests go unserved if achieving them would impose undue harm. And so my question was, that makes it sound like law enforcement interests and proportionality are opposites of each other, or they're in conflict, and that proportionality is not an interest of law enforcement. So I, I just, maybe, I mean, that's just the way it feels to me, and uh, doesn't, doesn't, the goals of law enforcement, the interests of law enforcement, include proportionality? I mean, the way, maybe it's just that you need to add a word that says other interests, right? Can you read that again? Sure. It's 300.4. No, I'm just saying. Maybe she can share. I can read it to you and I have both here. The proportionality principle demands that law enforcement interests go unserved if achieving them I think that that goes back to our, our values of uh, sanctity of human life, building community trust. And so what it what means is if, if there is a proportionality, if we're using forces beyond the proportions and the balance of what an arrest or what a level of resistance would meet, if we're exceeding that, then we're damaging that community trust. Right. And that's what it means by it goes unserved in our community. Yes, I understand the unserved part, I like, but I'm saying if you put interest there, that makes it sound like law enforcement has no interest. You know what I mean? Maybe if we just put in other interests, right? You'd like other interests other than, do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's like, that sounds like, well, poor us. I mean, I, don't, I know you don't mean it this way. I'm just reading it and telling you what it made me feel and the way I think some other people I know would interpret it. So it's like, it's not, because the rest of it I liked. I mean, I liked the rest of what you said about proportionality. So it's just that sentence, I'm wondering, it feels like it's saying that there's a conflict between law enforcement interests and proportionality. I don't think you mean that. So, yeah. Uh, so again, the, the proportionality principle demands that law enforcement interests go unserved if achieving them it would impose a new harm. Thus, when an officer faces a threat to the officer's safety, or should not be substantially disproportionate to the threat of physical harm. That's great. I'm still, there's still something in that sentence that maybe, maybe I'm not saying it clearly, but that you, it appears to say that the interests of law enforcement do not include proportionality the way the sentence is worded. So maybe ask, you know, does that make sense? If you said, if you, let me say how I would, how I would change it. Not that, I mean, not that I'm right, but I'm just saying it, it hit me wrong. Yeah, so I would say the court demands that law enforcement, that some law enforcement interests 
or you know, or different, go unserved if achieving them would, because you have one interest, which is to arrest somebody, right? Your other interest is to be proportional. I mean, you have to be proportional in the arrest. And the way it's worded, I would say just change it to other interests or some interests or, uh, you know, it would really be when when some actions maybe don't put interest in there. Interest is what's up. Is sounds like it's a goal or or it's an it's like that's all you care about. It's the word interest that just maybe I'll I'll work on it and see if I can think of something. What does that sentence mean to you? Well, to me it means uh, I mean, like I said, the sentence before and after I like them because <laughs> they are very clear to say that you're you're being careful about life. They're very careful. This one means to me that um, that. There's something that law enforcement interests go unserved means there's something they can't, it's a very strong word to say interest to me. It's like it's your goal. Law enforcement, it's the word interest is, is confusing to me because to me if I say the interest is like, well, that's what we want, and then it says, well, then we have to do this because we have to give up our interest to proportionality. So I would say proportionality sh is, should be included as one of law enforcement interests, and I think it is. <laughs> That interest or that objective, yeah. we give yeah. up if it goes unmarked. I'll work on it and see if I can share it. Yeah. Well, if, if, I can, yeah. if I can chime in um, sort of to Kathleen's defense, we were talking about um, why were some of these things asked to be put onto this agenda, and this is maybe a good example of it, is that as we're talking it through, even in the, the smaller working group, sometimes we're having difficulty putting our finger on precisely the right. thing that is, um, feels discordant about a sentence or about a, a topic or whatever it is, and it can be more useful to have more minds in right. on that discussion to yeah. try to identify what it yeah. is that we're taking issue with. Oh, I was just going to say, I, it made me think of Sergeant Bishop's uh, example of body slamming an 80 year old woman to the floor. Uh, uh, how, how many times did it happen? It was not recommended. <laughs> but that, that's a great example, Chuck, because I mean, that's exactly a, an example of what proportionality or un, uh, uh, damaging public trust by not following. Is if an officer, yeah. you know, I might have to use force against Officer Williams, who's 240 pounds and a D1 wrestler, and he's used to, you know, he's all these experience and big and strong, right? Like, if I have to take him down, I might have to take him down hard. But, but if, if that 18 year old lady who is frail and subject to injury and technically part of our moral populations, and she's imposing the same amount of resistance, she's got her fists up and she's ready to fight, I'm not going to have the same proportional amount of force that I'm going to use on her as I would a big, strong guy like him. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of the, right. the real world breakdown. It's, it's, there needs to be a balance between the level of an offense that an officer is investigating or making arrest on, the, the level of resistance the subject is providing, and the amount of force the officer applies to affect that outcome, that arrest, uh, that attention, uh, whatever that objective is. Yeah. All while, in the broader sense, making sure that all lookers from the community and that the body camera footage that gets released later to the public is all helping to serve our public, our, our, our interest of building that public trust, you know, ensuring that we're serving the entire community right. as a whole and protecting those we're serving the right. public. Can I have a follow up question with this um, hypothetical that I think you're saying? If I'm understanding correctly, you're saying you've done this at least a half a dozen times this week of slamming. Uh, <laughs> totally kidding. Totally kidding. Um, if, if we stick with that hypothetical, right, um, there's an 80 year old but clearly frail woman, you know, ready to go to fisticuffs with you. Um, and you decide that in that moment the proportionality doesn't match, right? You, you don't need to do whatever it was you were trying to accomplish with this woman at the time, how would you refer to those other law enforcement interests other than proportionality that are going to go unserved if you just withdraw from that encounter entirely? Well, we still have the duty to enforce laws, affect arrests, and things of that sort. I think that... Um, I don't, I don't think, I mean, again, this is all circumstantial. It kind of depends on what the lady's wanting for. She's wanted for murdering her husband. We're going to stay there until we take her to test and make sure that the public is served by affecting that risk. You know? oh. If this is something very minor, there's no official, you know, 
And I mean, maybe I just need to think of some other words that I would use, and you may not like them. But I understand what you're really—I know what you're really trying to say. To me, the sentence didn't say it, but that's—it's not that. I'm, I'm really appreciating, though, we get to talk to BPD. It's wonderful. Just before we move on to Stephanie's question, just to close it off, I mean, this is something we can take back with our team as well. Like, yeah, let's talk about it some more. Yeah. Is there a better way that we can right, this right. and write this and send a more clear message on what our team yes. is this part of it? Yeah, because the rest of it is very clear to me. The whole rest of the proportionality I liked a lot. Sorry, I think this sort of dovetails into this conversation. I think the other thing that we had sort of flagged for a conversation here was um, in the stipulated judgment um, in paragraph three, subsection C, subsection three, it talks about um, providing express guidance on proportionality to ensure officers understand the relationship that should exist between law enforcement objective they are attempting to achieve the threat presented and the force required in a particular situation, the guidance may include adopting a spectrum chart or matrix that can take the form of a graphical representation. And so one of the questions slash comments that we were gonna suggest that sort of dovetails into this, um, this conversation is, you know, um, considering the inclusion of um, some sort of graphical representation that, that better depicts uh, proportionality. You know, other law enforcement agencies um, throughout the state of California and nationwide, frankly, uh, use either, you know, some, some variation of this, and sometimes they have uh, factors to be considered and then bullet points. Sometimes they have, um, you know, some other sort of like chart that's used or some sort of like matrix um, in, in their proportionality section, but it touches on, you know, some of these factors that you're, you're, you were discussing, right? Um, but I think that that one helps crystallize for officers so, you know, recognizing that it's not an exhaustive list of factors that, that are to be considered, but it helps provide um, some guidance to officers, but it also helps um, the community better understand, like, okay, when we're talking about proportionality, like, what does that mean? What does that look like? Like, as a community member, you can better sort of visualize what that sort of, um, what that, you know, you can get a better visual if you have some sort of graphical representation or some sort of like enumerated factors of things that officers are taking into consideration. Um, you know, um, yeah, so anyways, and, and they would touch on some of the things that you were talking about, right? Like whether the person um, is known to be, ex known to have uh, a mental health, um, uh, you know, or, or on their 911 call, like if, if they indicated that this person was experiencing a mental health or behavioral health crisis, or if, um, you know, the officers, um, you know, assess that this person has a mental, is experiencing a mental health or behavioral health crisis, has some sort of other physical or mental disability um, or developmental disability, uh, you know, like these age factors that you were talking about, whether the person is pregnant, like these are factors that you, um, right, without making it an exhaustive list and, and happy to share um, some sort of 
the different ways other departments throughout the state and throughout, well, I like to just, I mean, throughout the country too, um, that have like implemented some of these, but I think it's helpful, not just for officers, but like I said, for the community to be able to, in, a, in an easy and digestible way, understand what the parameters of that sort of look like with the caveat recognizing that it's not exhaustive, right? It's just like things to, to consider. But I think it would help clarify maybe some of the points that were being discussed and raised here by other folks and, and what you were discussing, and it helps sort of marry the two, I think. Like, like, was it 10 minutes? Yes. I have a response for you soon to Come to our work. <laughs> Do we have? Is your email? Are you added to the CAP email yet? Or? Yeah, we're doing all of that. Okay, screen. so yeah. if we want to reach her, she'll be on there. Well, I guess. Oh, no, no, no. I spoke out to you. So just to, to recap where we left off before the break, Stephanie asked a question about proportionality and how it relates with the visual representation uh, or some type of graphical representation that we can include in the policy. So. One thing that um, at one point we did have in one of the draft policies a, a visual graph representation, not specific to proportionality, but specific to a uh, forced decision making cycle. And it had uh, different levels of force, different levels of resistance, when they would apply and whatnot. Uh, ultimately, the decision was made to remove that for the draft that was submitted, uh, but we did have one at one point. But what I want to iterate a little bit more is that. Um, the policy is, is the, it, it is that. It's a policy, it's a guideline for us to use in our training and in how officers are doing the job on the streets. The training is to come out of this. And if you guys don't know this about police officers, they're very visual learners. They like to see videos, they like to see visual representations and hear real stories of how things are applied in the real world. So with that, whenever we teach proportionality, oftentimes we are either showing a picture of or, or writing on board or visually representing uh, pretty much scales, you know? If you think of proportionality, you think of scales and them being balanced or like you know, almost like the scales of justice. And with proportionality, the amount of force used needs to be proportional with the level of resistance that the officer is being met with, the type of offense or the, the suspected crime that the officer is investigating and other circumstances that go into that context. That needs to be balanced into what the community expects of police officers. So that's sort of how we represent it in a visual manner uh, when in, in, in the training environment. Yeah, I, I, I understand the training aspect, and that's great if you all incorporate that into training, but you know, I think that there's a difference between having it in training and having it in the policy. The policy also creates a level of accountability for officers, so if it's clearly, you know, again, realizing that it's not going to be an exhaustive list of things, but aside from visibility for the community to better understand the factors that are considered when, uh, it, you know, that go into sort of purport, like a, whether a force is proportional or not to a, a particular um, incident, 
It also creates uh, a level of accountability for officers. Um, otherwise, without that, you know, you ha you're you're left with honestly a vague and broad policy where many actions by officers would be deemed to be within policy and then therefore there would be no discipline of the officer. And so it would maintain in essence the status quo, um, which you know is something that community members have raised concerns about. Um, and so if I, I think you know other other law enforcement agencies throughout the state of California have not just this continuum of force that you were discussing in terms of better sort of or you know graphically depicting um, you know, level one force, this type of, you know, resistance, level two force, this type of resistance, and maybe these tools or whatever. But it, but it enumerates particular factors, um, like, I, like I had mentioned previously, like, you know, you know, if someone is pregnant, like, blah, blah, blah. If someone is, you know, experiencing a mental health uh, crisis, you know, yada, yada. Or if someone is, you know, under the influence of sub or you know of substances or has a history of substance use you know known history of substance use or you know um, you know like just other other sort of factors that were mentioned here in conversation by by you by other cap members I mean it, I, I I don't think it's um, it's not a novel thing it's not like a novel concept that I'm sort of like oh you should you know one it's suggested in in the um, stipulated judgment and two. Um, it's something that other law enforcement agencies have done, and so I think that you know we can, we can we can learn from them, we can pull from it, and we can help incorporate something that will work best for the Bakersfield community, but also be uh, I, I guess manageable for for BPD to, to implement. And if it's something that is already being trained on, then it doesn't seem like it's a huge lift to also incorporate that into, into policy. Does that make sense? Like, or anyways, that, that's just my I think. Do you have um, specific examples of, of either of these representations that you can share with us for yeah. us to look at? Maybe yeah, I'll, I'll email them to, to you all and to the cap so people can see them. But. Yeah, that'd be great because I think that, uh, like I said before, we have used some of those uh, charts, graphs, or whatever to help officers and, and whatnot. Um, do, you, uh, do you have uh, like specific examples or, or I don't really understand what you mean by holding officers accountable to it like with oh, from, from the graph? Because like in oh. parts of the policy, there's there's obviously very clear prohibitions that are lined out in the policy. But what do you mean by having it uh, help hold officers accountable accountable based off of the crowd? So. Oh, not not off of well. So if it's in pol if it's in the policy, it's it's you know detailing it, it's it's reiterating I guess um, you know factors that officers should be taking into consideration. And I think right now. Um, that's not clear in the policy, and so if, say, for example, um, you know, an officer does, you know, or, or uses a, you know, a force that is not proportional, um, so like with this, with the 80-year-old woman or whatever, if if that's not in the policy and it's written in a sort of, sorry, we just keep going back to that. Oh, no, actually, use this example. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's, it's probably never happened, never happened right? <laughs> um, you know, if, if, if that, something like that happens, I think under, you know, the policy, I mean, you know, of, of course that's kind of an extreme example. And so, you know, of course I hope that, uh, you know, there would be some sort of accountability for the officer in terms of like, they would be disciplined, maybe require additional training, yada, yada. Um, if something maybe not as extreme were to happen, but the force is not, you know, the, the is, is not proportional, um, and you know internal affairs or you know the I don't I don't know is it internal affairs who investigates aside from critical review incident? There's 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 multiple factors uh, that go into that. There's internal affairs. We have a use of force working group that examines use of force on a uh, monthly basis, and the supervisors themselves go out and they respond to and investigate use of force whenever it occurs. To. So there's several levels that could catch something like that. You know, it could catch the officer the body slams to a lady, and it's not proportional to the amount of threat that they uh, are. I guess in a, in a less extreme example of that, you know, I think just having um, enumerated factors is helpful, is, is additional helpful guidance to the officers. It's, it's in policy and more than anything, like, you know, the policies are accessible to the public online. Mm -hmm. Trainings are not. And uh, yeah. even if you were to put, you know, a presentation deck on online, it doesn't have the 
you know, the narration part of it that the officers are receiving, right? And I don't know how many community members would sit through, you know, hours long training that officers receive anyways. Um, whereas like a, a policy is more accessible to the community. It's, it's more digest, you know, can, can be made in ways that's also addresses some of the things that community members or CAP members here have, have flagged about making it um, digestible in a way where it's like more, uh, yeah, where community Everything. members themselves can, can better understand <coughs> what they and I think enumerating those factors is just beneficial to everyone and also like suggested by the stipulated judgment. So, you know, I, I, and, and it, like I said, it dovetails into like the comments and the conversations that were happening here earlier, but I'm happy to circulate. I, I know I've promised other folks, um, I'm looking at you, David, to share some of those uh, additional examples. So I'll, I'll, um, um, I'll, I'll send those out by email to, to BPD. And I don't know if everyone is on that CAP email, but I'll, I'll share with Chief yeah, Terry. Yeah, if you send to the CAP and to whoever you would normally send to, to Timothy, then all staff will be there. Okay, cool. Cool. What was the rationale to remove that matrix from the new policy? Is it looking at the totality of the circumstances? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll let him off the hook. Do you want to answer that one too? <laughs> it, it's been in and out. There's a version of it in the policy still, even though it's not depicted in, in that kind of a graph. So I think it's on page 12 or 13, where it talks about these kind of factors to consider and it breaks things down. But um, just some inside work, if you, you know, if we have had some internal dialogue about how to best represent it. Uh, there was not a lot of clarity internally. Uh, our conversations with the monitor too about how to appropriately represent. So uh, still, still a conversation. Uh, but it, it, it been in, came out, went back in, came out again. So for simplicity, I would tell you that it's not in there. Anymore. But happy to revisit it, if, especially if you have a good example. So that could be a legitimate recommendation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for the record, we like some form of visual representation like that. It is easy to digest for not just the community, but for officers yeah. as well. And if we have something that we can kind of just even put up as a display amongst the department in our training environment for us to kind of point to like, hey, remember, like this is our decision-making cycle. These are the factors you consider. So that it's not just an policy that an officer has to read and you know pass a test on once a year and receive annual training on, but it's just permeated throughout everything that we do with our training environment, with the types of training that we're doing, with what an officer is seeing as they go to work every day, all sorts of factors. I have a follow-up from last time. We were talking about um, how these recommendations or questions could be submitted, not just on Conveo. Um, and I think we had talked about there being like an online form. <coughs> How's that coming? So um, it kind of goes into another discussion. I don't know if you want to talk about the recommendation answer first. Oh. Yeah, so uh, I think it was April. Uh, we talked about the recommendations for the use force policy, and uh, it was good. I, I think the, the cap said potentially may, but more likely June. Is that still consistent? Do you expect the no, recommendations I, in June? I don't think so. I think that we're so. Um, we're I, I think I page shared. Nine. We're on page nine. <laughs> I think I shared briefly. Um, were you on the call with? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. I, I've only interfaced with you a little bit. Sorry. Um, um, I think I shared in that space that we're still, the working group, you know, even though we're meeting on a weekly basis and we meet for like an hour and a half, um, we're about a little shy of like halfway through the, we're about halfway through yeah. the policy. Um, um, and so I think that we as a work group will need a, a, some additional time um, to go through it. Um, and then be in a place to, to provide formal recommendations or, you know, formal, rec yeah, recommendations to, to BPD. So I think, though, we need, what, are, what would that look like? Because this policy has been working for quite some time. And there does need to be, we need to come to a date for recommendations. And for the cap as a whole, not just for the group working, but we should have a 
an expectation that a date that we're shooting for. So how much time do you believe you would need in order to get to the point where we can start making recommendations? You guys seem to already have quite a few recommendations. On Can we start putting point. forth these recommendations uh, that we've already compiled at this point? Or I think that's hard only because, well, you know, everyone should feel free to do whatever whatever they want. But um, for the group. But I think it's it's hard because uh, there are, you know, there are different sections later on in the policy that interface or interact with like previous parts of, of the policy and even as we've gone through it like sometimes we refer back to previous sections and then we'll do like um some you know some modifications in our in our suggest in, you know, in our in our in our thoughts or, or whatever and so um i think it's hard to i think i think it would be hard because then it would lead us to like constantly sort of be like modifying any sort of uh, previously submitted formal recommendation to BPD. I think if we do something by like August, it would give us, you know, you know, the next couple of weeks um, to to work on this. Um, you know, taking into account that summer vacation is coming up, and I don't know if folks are going on vacation, um, but you know, if 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 there's like a, a time frame that most people are going on vacation, or you know, most people are going to be missing a, one of these meetings, you know, affording them. An opportunity to only take a break because it's you know every Tuesday for an hour and a half. So I know it's 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 um, a lot for for some folks. Um, so you know I think it would give us an opportunity to finish our internal <coughs> conversations and then put together uh, the formal recommendations in a way that um, that is you know uh, that utilizes the form that you all are creating and hopefully almost or are working on. But. That, that seems like an awfully long time. Um, I, think, I think that's an awful long time. I really, this, think, like, I really think that we need to expedite a little quicker than August for sure. Just like we're not expecting a unanimous recommendation from the CAP, if we send out the, the documents again, and then as you're ready to, just submit them, and then we won't be necessarily sitting stagnant because we'll get recommendations coming in, so we can start looking into those and uh, making a determination of whether or not we're going to accept the recommendation. Uh, at least we can start doing part of the work. And then, and that's what I'm. Th I mean, I, I, I'm going to be honest here. We obviously have certain members of the committee that are ready to move on. And I understand that there are members of the community that are, this community partnership that is uh, still wanting a lot more time. And that, but to be equitable to everybody that's in this, I think. I mean, I could submit my recommendations this month and submit them, right? And I've worked with you guys, and I, I understand that. But I'm just saying, just to be equitable and to move this. Um, what if we do it, it by like July and then BPD does its presentation in August? Because you know, I mean, I, I get. I, just, I, I, I don't get, think we're going to get I, people showing up anymore, and I just think it's I, going to. I, don't I, think I get we that. We need it's, them all on one specific day. Yeah. So I, I think the people that are ready could go ahead and submit, and then our team could start looking into that stuff, and then. As we handle them when they come in. Does it create more work for you, though, well, in, I'm in gonna having to? Um, I'm going to jump in a little bit. So, with the framework, I think it's important that we submit a report that gets a response. Otherwise, you guys aren't going to get a complete report. You're going to get five multiple reports. So, I, mm -hmm. I think it's important, um, as we're working through these things, that we set some, set some benchmarks. Now, I know in that framework, I have a proposed perfect scenario time frame. I understand that we may not, each policy may not get, need, and may need more, we need to make some adjustments. But if we don't set a bar, we don't know how we need to jump. And I think we do need to move to these recommendations so that you can respond to them. So um, I kind of agree with, with Tabitha. I'm going to throw this out there to kind of split the difference to go ahead and get, if we can get some recommendations in and submit a report um, in July. You guys have had this policy for over a year now. Yeah, we gotta. We have to come to some. I may be incorrect about that. We haven't had it for a year. Not for a year. Still, we've had it for a while. We've had it for a while. Well, right? well. Um, so to to. We didn't have a working group then. So with this, the working group has been only a couple, three months maybe. 
But I think also if Chuck was ready to submit his recommendation tomorrow and he submits it in, that would be a recommendation that Chuck sent in. And he may be going to Europe for the summer. And he'll have his yeah. out there on it. And that does not stop the working group from coming with their recommendation. But we do need to have a, we need to have a, a date. Yeah. So yes, I, the form is ready to go. You guys can submit recommendations tomorrow. So I have it set up. I, have, I can send it out so people can submit recommendations to me. But at the same time, we want to present a report that BPD takes and we have to, if we're doing one recommendation at a time, we lose that transparency, we lose that, that there's a report that they're responding to. Otherwise, we're going to have multiple reports, we're going to have a lot of duplication, it kind of eliminates the strategy that we kind of agree on. So I would say if it's July, if it's that July meeting, August, whatever, we need to come to consensus on a date that we're done with use of force. And then based upon that world, we can have whatever discussion moving forward. But I do want to, as each recommendation comes in, we respond. I, I, I don't think that that gets us to where we, where we want to go. There has to be a point where, even if we, it is a year, right? You gotta have a, a done date. We have to have a date where we're so yeah, I just, date will it be like July 1st? Right. Because the thing is, you want it in before July 9th because it's you guys really want to hear what the BPD has to say at that meeting, or y'all just want to get it in on the night, and then you're going to be waiting for August to hear their their I think that's how we've done it in the past, yeah. is where we submit it by the next CAP meeting, and then if there's, uh, you know, any sort of outstanding sort of questions that we have, we, like, flag them or discuss them in that section, but, like, also then move on to other policies or discuss other you know, I'm not saying that this is how it has to be, but this is just how we've done it, and I think it's worked worked well. I'm kind and of there with you as well that if hypothetically you submit your recommendations at the team meeting, that gives us an opportunity for discussion to hear directly from you on your recommendations as well. Yeah. Not just having a board, and then we can respond to it at the August meeting. Yeah. To, to the entire team. So I'm with you that. The also thing I'll throw out there too that we recognize that this use of force policy is the largest that you're going to have to work through. Yeah. It, and it's it's the vast majority of the stipulated agreement anyway, but also the policies that you have now, the three draft, they're all related. And so I fully recognize that some of the conversations, the discussions, as you go through the, all the other use of force related, it's gonna be kind of a going back and what about this? Happy to revisit some of those things and we can go back on the use of force policy, we made this recommendation, we didn't do it, but we, now we have a question about this. You can raise those questions and give us that input, and we and we will consider those things as well. We're not going to reopen the thing, but we go, hey, this is closely related in this use of force scenario. In the main use of force policy, there was a discussion of this or whatever. I recognize that you're still going to be dealing with use of force issues for the next several policies, and there necessarily is going to be some reference back to it. So this is not something that we're never going to discuss with you again. That's not going to happen. But so I'm saying just saying that that's there and I recognize that through the course of our upcoming policy work that there is going to be some necessity to revisit some of these issues. Tell us how this is related. Tell us how this is covered. If this is what your policy says related to this, handcuffing techniques, how is it in the category of use of force or whatever the related question is. I'm just saying, I'm throwing it out there that I recognize that there is going to be some broad use of force conversations again, because we're still dealing with use of force policies. And I think also, just to piggyback off of it, if there, if we do set a deadline of June or July, if there's a question, are we still able to pose the question prior to the next meeting? So that way, yes. yeah. whatever question you have, email it, please, yes. so we can get those questions asked, because that way we don't asking for things at the meeting. And, and if we're not being responsive like we told you we would be related to those kinds of questions, then call and yell at the didn't <laughs> <laughs> uh, But no, we want to be responsive to you, uh, and I mean that. And so if, if that's not what you're experiencing from us, tell us. I guess I, I the reason why I suggested August, I know it, it seems like a long time, is, is just 
on the point that Chief Terry made about this is, you know, the biggest policy. It's the policy that has pages upon pages under the stipulated judgment, you know, to sort of cross compare with or whatever. Um, um, and it's, it's sort of like the foundational policy for other policies, right? Like the, the other policies that they, that BPD recently circulated, um, you know, I, I, my hope is that those will go by a lot faster and we probably can do all three of those at like the same time, right? Because they're important policies as well, certainly, but um, this is sort of like the foundation that lays or this, this lays the foundation for us assessing those other policies and, and the cap will be in a much better position knowing, you know, okay, we've, we've, you know, really grappled with what is, you know, this type of force, what is this type of force, or what is this definition, or what is this, or how does this, or whatever, and we'll be a bit better able to understand how it sort of interacts with some of the policies that are to come. And then once we're done with the use of force policies altogether, like, you know, I, the, 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 the other ones that are to come are also important, but you know, much just looking at them from their policy manual on BPD's website, much of them are like much shorter in length and also the stipulated judgment terms are like much shorter. It's like, like a, you know, a bullet point or two, um, maybe like a paragraph in, in, uh, on a page, whereas like the use of force <coughs> portion is over like 10, 15 pages in the stipulated judgment for just this policy. No, I, I totally get that, and I, and I do, but we, uh, I just am trying to be as effective in these monthly meetings as we can, and also just to kind of, you know, get get through this, and I know you guys have we've all been working really hard on this, by no means am I, you know, minimizing that, but at the same time, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to get forward and, and sometimes we talk about one word for entire you know for the whole meeting and I just I want to you know I and, I and by no means again I'm not minimizing that I'm just saying sometimes we've got to he, he's uh, chief Terry said he's going to we can revisit things if they come up in the we don't have to be perfect right now we can revisit it and we can reopen it and we can rediscuss it but I think we need to give them something to start working on. That's why I, that's why I was trying to say at least let's start submitting well, things to she, BPD. She, she doesn't well, my, want them submitted, my, though. My, my, but my, make sure I understand. You don't she, want them submitted one at a oh, time. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. I, I think, look, I'm in, I'm in agreement with both, okay? I don't think there's nothing wrong with extending it to the office, but I think at the same time, Start submitting your, 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 all your stuff so that she can look at it. Because if she wants, she, she recommends it one more time. Only thing that they're actually saying that we need to give them a date. That's what they're asking for. They, they just don't want it to be way out into the future, but they need a date. That's the, that's the key point. So if we went with all this, as long as we giving them a date and you really submitted your, your requests, all your paperwork and your suggestions, then they can move on. Yeah. I, I would, I it, I'm still not clear. Are you saying, I think you're saying you don't want us to send now. You want them all to come at once. Is that true? Or well, am I well, misunderstanding you? I send now, but I would like to say that if it's Okay, so I didn't nine, understand. Then I mean, you can start sending. I'm going to start compiling the report. Okay. But based upon the framework, once I get the report, I want you all to verify that I've represented your recommendations appropriately. So I want you guys to have a chance to see the report before I submit it to you. So if we do ones and twos, that means your recommendation will automatically go to BPD and there's not going to be that transparency, that validation that yes, I've copied and pasted and built the report as you guys sent those recommendations in. Now, um, doesn't mean I can't make those recommendations visible to BPD, so maybe they can't start looking at it on the back end, but if July 9th is the date that you guys all have your recommendations and that's the final date, I'm going to compile that report at that date and send it formally to BPD. I would like to send one formal recommendation report for that policy. Now, you guys can start sending recommendations tonight, and I can start building that report. So absolutely. With the next policies, the same thing. The minute that they present, you guys can start submitting recommendations. I'm going to have that live the whole time. So I'm constantly building that report. And if you look at that framework, I have confirmation emails. I'm giving you guys reference numbers. So that I'm building that as we go. So essentially, on that ninth or whatever that date is, 
I'm not building the report from scratch. I've been building it as you've been submitting recommendations. So probably within a few days of that due date of the 9th or the 13th, that report will be ready to get pushed back out to you guys for review and then push directly to BPD so they can start responding. Oh. I like that. <coughs> so the committee so, will have a chance to review it in so, so the date when we'd get the review, it would be, till, we turn it in on, you, you'd finish it July 9th, and then after that we could review it, or before yeah, that? So it just depends on how many Whatever date we pick, okay. Whatever date we pick, after we pick a date and give it to you, and you finish the whole report, then you'll send it back to yeah, us. So it will, it will go back up to you guys to say, yes, you've uh, represented my recommendations as I've stated that. It's not your approval of the whole report. It's that you have been represented as you sent your things in. And then once everyone is said, yep, I've been, my things are there as I said, then that whole formal report will get sent to BPD to respond. One report. And the concept of your report does not mean the recommendation doesn't come as a recommendation from the work group as well as the other individuals. Mm -hmm. So it's not taking any power away from the work group <laughs> that have been cranking out wrong. It gives everybody else an opportunity to have that in. And the BPD now is getting a compensation of everybody's at a given point in time. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, on the, the only, only other reason why it's suggesting like sort of August, or you know, I mean, happy to consider July too if that's what folks folks want um, is just um, I know I know Chief Terry is saying that we can come back to and that this is sort of like an open thing that we can sort of circle back to and and um, make recommendations to and sort of revisit but you know at least my understanding of what you shared earlier is that like once you receive recommendations and you start incorporating them they send it you know they, they send it to DOJ to, to review um, and so if we're revisiting things at a later point, um, you know, then that's going to sort of like open that, you know, well, we like just, it might back a little bit. We will periodically review our policies all the time. Uh, we frequently make policy changes and then push them out organizationally periodically throughout the year or so. But we make policy changes all the time as more information comes in, a better way to do this or that. So uh, we make policy changes all the time. So I'm just saying that board is open to you at any time to submit <laughs> recommendations for policy changes of a particular policy. We'll revisit it, we'll respond to you, and if we incorporate it, we incorporate it in the policy, most of the time in, 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 uh, in the form of a directive that I'll issue out of my office, and then we can do the formal policy and then just incorporate those out. And there's a lot of different ways it's done. But so there's always opportunity for your voice to be heard and, and provide recommendations. That's what I was going to say. The DOJ uh, probably has, a, 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 this is a working document. I mean, we're constantly, I mean, we're, as long as we're working we on will it. Submit, we will formally submit through the monitor okay. uh, the uh, policy for DOJ approval. But that doesn't mean that it's set to can never be revisited or changed. That's not, obviously not the case. We, we do that often. Point of clarification, I'm going to be the only newbie in the group who does not know all of the things we all have been through in the last few years. Um, is, there, is there a, it doesn't sound like there's a firm date where we need to get something in, but we're already behind, whatever date that might be because we've been working on it. Is that accurate? So, kind of. Okay. I think we're trying to come to that. Right. I think there's been a, a but I think it's, we're trying to figure out what's a reasonable time. Yeah, and I've managed committees before, and I'm not difficult that can be. So the um, other question I have, though, it sounded like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. And, thank you. Um, I, uh, I, I thought I heard you say that you'll take all the submit submissions, and everybody will look at their piece to make sure that they've been included. If it sounded like then you would send it out just for that final review of everybody's individual submission, will we have the opportunity opportunity for some of us newer folks? I understand these guys are pretty new too. And uh, so that we can read through the entire thing and then ask 
questions or clarifications yes. on the entire piece. So what I'll do is I'll compile everyone's individual recommendations into one report. That full report will get sent out to everyone to validate their recommendations, but we'll be able to see the full report that will be submitted. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to pose a question to the people that have been attending at the working group and actually participating in making the headway through this. Do we think we can be done by the June or the July meetings? Not there. I don't think June. June, no. But I have a question about the June meeting anyway. What are we, are you going to go ahead and do the presentation that time or should we spend, we could spend part of that time working on it? You know, so at that point, it yes, would have had policy sort of oh. well over 30. Oh yeah, the new policy. So yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so, okay. so no, we couldn't be done by June. No. July maybe. I don't that's know. That's not what Jacob was asking. No. Thank you, Keith. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> what were you asking? In our weekly meetings, in getting through the use of force policy, if we continue those weekly yes. at the rate that we've been going, how soon do we think we can be done getting through this policy in that group? That would be one, that's, two. That's kind of why I was saying one, two. August, only because it would give us an opportunity to continue going through it, you know, on a weekly yeah. basis and, uh, you know, allowing for maybe like a week off or whatever, you know, for folks to just have like a week off from, from meeting weekly on, on this. But even if we don't take a week off or whatever, it would give folks an opportunity, you know, we would, we would be able to like move through the policy and hopefully be done with it internally sometime in July, but then give people an opportunity to like actually then, you know, do the, the recommendations, which might take a little bit of time, which might not meet that July 9th deadline, but could well be, you know, by end of July or early August or whatever. Um, but that's, I guess that's why I was suggesting the August one. Just, you know, I, I don't, I guess I just, uh, my concern is, is setting sort of like an artificial deadline um, that rushes this process for such a critical policy like I understand that folks want to you know that we've had this since November I mean in November we were still discussing the canine policy and, and finalizing it and for December science. was sort of like a, for a weird <laughs> month you know with holidays and yada yada but um, I I just you know it's such an important policy that I don't I, I, I guess I, I would hate to have sort of like this artificial deadline of, of June and, and rush the rest of this policy um, for the sake of just finishing and submitting recommendations when it's so critical and, and like I said, it's a foundational piece of other policies that we are set to review next and uh, other policies that are to come. So how many people are there working with the year that can actually make a decision if August would be better for you or if because if, if you got nine people, all your committee, your group is working, you're working over here, then maybe you guys need to kind of ask each other and you get the date. If all this work does, because that's what 71 is the working group that the clients were with Stephanie asking for, or the working group want to go with the July date that tells us not in the working group that have said. So that's, I think that's the question you group going to have to make. Can y'all uh, go with July? Can y'all go with the study recommendations so we can give them a date right now? If I can ask you, I would ask you, and I won't ask you. <laughs> <laughs> make, it, make it to July if this matters, and we will make whatever people, personnel available to you as often as you need to answer questions, either in person, in Zoom, via conveyor questions, however you need to have that discussion. So just throwing that resource out to you. We have, bigger picture, we have a lot of policies um, to get through the gap, to move toward the improvements that I know we all have interest in that. And, and I know you do as well. Uh, and there are some major um, improvements that we want to make with all of these use sports related policies. We have a big one now, Stephanie, but right? it is the foundational document for them. So if July can happen, I think it's important to our work, certainly important to the police department that we get this going as soon as possible. And so if that helps, we will make whatever resources available to you uh, as often as you need it to help you arrive at, at that. So I just throw that out. Thank you. 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 Thank you
I, I like the July. I like the July. I, I know I've missed the last few. It's been finals. It's been finals week. I'm sorry. Um, I know I've missed the last few, but I would. I would like. I mean, we've gone over it and read it so many times. Like only the first half. We haven't even read. You haven't read. You oh, haven't yes, read, read past. Well, That's what I'm myself, saying. I we have. we've all read it individually. We all have read through this policy hundred of times, right? I mean, <laughs> okay, maybe not a hundred times, but we've read through it quite extensively, right? We haven't, all I'm saying is, I think we really should shoot for July, guys. I really think we need to get this. I know it's, it's voluminous, I know there's a lot that, but like he was saying, we can't make the improvements until we give it to them. I mean, we're just delaying the improvements that we're so ready to get to. I mean, yeah, yeah, and yes, um, yes and yes, the and. fact that, like, like I said, this is such a, like, yes, we want to see these improvements, but if it's rushed, like, what is the meaning of that for the community and for the actual change that we want to see, right? Like, if if it's a, it's, if it's a, you know, I, I defer to everyone else. I, I mean, I, I've been talking a lot, so if other folks on the work group yeah. or other CAP members, even if you're not a part of the working group, have thoughts like by all means like please chime in I, I don't mean to like monopolize this conversation and I don't want to also set arbitrary dates if folks think that it should be September or October you know make that recommendation um, but I, I'm not, not saying that, that you know I'm not saying that but I'm just, I, I'm just saying like you know you, you should feel comfortable to also voice what you what you want um, but I guess the point the point that I'm trying to drive home is just that that I, I would hate to rush this really important policy um, again that is like foundational you know but like is so important and is really at the crux of a lot of of, of the stories that uh, you know impacted community members have shared with us and is really at the heart of well one of the 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 hearts of this stipulated judgment and one of the the main pieces of like the, 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 the center of the investigation that led to this, the stipulated judgment and the stories of impacted people that were, that were collected and, and uh, discussed as part of this investigation that led to the stipulated judgment. And so I get that like, you know, of course we want to implement this as soon as possible um, and we want to get through, through this process and we don't want to delay it and we want to implement it so that it, it goes into effect. I just would hate for it to be at the cost of of really creating meaningful change within the stipulated judgments within state law, I, I get conversations we've had previously. But I understand. I well, totally get I that. Have a question: How about voting? Or talking to yeah, all the members please, of Congress? Other people, please think. chime in. I don't want to talk anymore. But, but you know, I would just say: um, Can we? Can we? Have, can we get other people's input? Like Chuck, what do you? Are you? I want to know where people are going to be here. That's part of the question, right? How if everybody? Most people will be here for the next six weeks if we, to meet or not. Because that would help us decide, I think. Eight weeks before it's due, July. So that's six weeks, six, six, six working group meetings. It's going to yeah. get through the rest of the policy at six working group meetings. I think if we're focused, we can. And I think if, if you know, we, we also have to remember we can't overthink and look at every single word and dissect every single word and you know, I'm, we've got to look at the totality of the document, too, not just, yeah. you know. I don't think we are. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we did pick one sentence, right? And, and, and we've talked about that one sentence. So all I'm saying is I just, I think we should try to focus. If folks are comfortable with July, I'm, I'm comfortable. I, I just want to make sure everyone yeah. is, too. I just want well, to yeah. I prefer you. I prefer you. Oh, we can. <laughs> we cannot. Do it. It's impossible. Yeah, you're, you're asking yeah, preferences, yeah. but I'm comfortable with July. It, I wouldn't want to see us push. I understand where you're coming from, but I wouldn't want to see us push it to August. So I think if we can settle on July, then that's a good compromise for both kind of sides of the equation. And in terms of the working group, the working group is the whole cap if they want to be involved. Yeah.